I worked with a church in Seattle, Washington, uh, a couple of years ago at this point, to help them articulate their future story. And it's good to know for a church to know what you're called to do and with whom you're called to be in ministry. And the church prayerfully discerned that the, the doors that the Holy Spirit kept opening were filled with senior citizens. The pastor was invited to do a worship service in a nursing home, which led to ministry with the staff there. And then another parishioner had a parent in, in a nursing home and that turned into another worship service. And at one point, the pastor and the leadership realized that their church was growing, just not in the sanctuary. And they started to think about their church as having several campuses, one that met in the church's sanctuary and the others that met offsite. And families would, would visit uh, their worship service when they were in town to meet the people who were loving on their parents and to say thank you. And it became apparent that the, that the ministry that, that was growing, that God was blessing was this ministry with seniors. But there was resistance. Imagine the resistance from some members of the congregation who could only think of church in terms of gathering in the sanctuary, and they only felt good about themselves if the sanctuary was full on Sunday mornings, uh, and they, of course they wanted to see little children running around and a youth group. And they had fought hard for that vision for years until, again, they realized that the doors that God was opening were open to, to children of, of you know, God's children of different ages, of the octogenarian and nonagenarian variety. And I use that word because um, I remember a conversation. I remember sitting with my grandfather who was turning 90. And he said, and he asked, you know, my, my sister and I, you know, do you know what it's you know, called when somebody's in their, in their 80s? And I don't remember if I knew the word at the time, but octogenarians. And he goes, and do you know what it is when it's 90s? Nonagenarians. So I, I whenever I think, use that word, I think of my grandfather. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure to work with this church. The spiritual discernment that they went through before I even showed up was completely impressed me. I even joked with them, are you sure you're Presbyterian? Because spiritual discernment is not, is not one of our strengths. Uh, years ago, I, I asked a, a colleague, a, a pastor, what is your experience of the Holy Spirit? Because I've had very few conversations with other Presbyterian pastors about that, how they experience the Holy Spirit. And, she, and, and her answer was perfect. She says, it's because we have no stated pneumatology, <laughs> which pneumatology is, is a theological word for the study of the Holy Spirit. And that just like sums it all up for Presbyterians. You know, how do we hear God? How do we discern? Uh, I've done a, a, a process of uh, spiritual discernment with a session and, 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 and advise them and my former in and the church that I was just serving. We went through this process and I said, we're going to go through a, a spiritual discernment process to make a, a, a tough decision in the church. And, and this is, we're going to go through this process, but I said to them, but be advised, we could do this whole thing and decide this is where we believe God is leading us. And then the Holy Spirit can wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you, you got it all wrong. And that's just how it works. I said this last week, I think, in, in my sermon. Some people are acting like God is closing up shop because institutional churches are struggling. The spirit of God is alive and well. What is God up to? Are we asking and are we willing to follow? At the beginning of Jesus's ministry in the gospel of Luke, he stands up and tells his hometown crowd what he has discerned as his mission. And he quotes Isaiah and he alludes to Leviticus. In Luke 4, we just read this, Luke 4, 18 and 19. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, we are only reading half the story. The second part of, of the story of, of what happens in the synagogue that day is, comes next week. And we know he's gonna be rejected, but we're not really dealing with that this week, but we know it's coming. Jesus is quoting two passages from Isaiah, Isaiah 61 verses one and two, and Isaiah 58 verse six. And then he alludes to Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor. And that's from Leviticus chapter 25. 
And the teaching there was, this was the instruction, that every 50 years a trumpet shall sound and prisoners will be set free. People will, re will return to their land, debts will be forgiven, the land will be given a rest, and everyone starts from, from, from go and gives glory to God. So listen again to Jesus's proclamation. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to promise to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And you can imagine them listening to this going, ooh, yeah, great, wonderful. And then wait, what, what was that last part? Jubilee? It's like saying, hey, kids, we're going to go to Disney World and we're going to ride the rides and meet all the Disney characters and we're going to stay at Cinderella's castle, but you won't get any allowance for the next two years. And the kids say, okay, I like everything except for the allowance part. <laughs> I like the grace part of the gospel, but not the sacrifice part. One of the critiques of modern society and this has been true since I've been in ministry, is that as our, as our horizons have expanded, our world has gotten smaller. And there's this smorgasbord of religions and faith traditions and spiritual practices that are presented before us. And there, there's a blessing in learning spiritual practices that may not have come out of Christianity, but you know, darned if you don't feel more at peace and closer to God by doing them. And it is good to understand other people's understandings of God and what we have in common. But the temptation is, like, imagine this is your plate. You'll say, okay, I'll take some of this and some of this and some of this, all your favorite foods. When you would really, we would all benefit from taking, taking some of the stuff because it's good for us or for other people or for God's children or for God's creation, because that was part of Jubilee too, giving the earth a rest. You know, our, our fortune cookie faith reads, love God, love neighbor, love self. You know, it's, it's that simple and that messy and that hard and wonderful and heartbreaking and asks way too much of us. You know, and sometimes we thank God for this call in our lives and other times we get angry and push back. You know, more about that next week. But it is in caring about other people that we are given hope. You know, I said to, to Carlos, um, my husband yesterday, it is so hard to read the news. But the only thing that counters the bad news is by defying it, by, by loving no matter what, by being generous of, of spirit and an encouragement and giving out of our abundance. In thinking about Jesus's mission statement, it, it was a repetition of, of the mission statement for the prophet Isaiah. And then the question jumps out at us is, it's part of our mission statement too, to live sacrificially for all God's creation, the poor, the captive, the blind, the oppressed. And then of course, the question for self-reflection, how are we doing? How are we doing? The need of the world is overwhelming. So I wanna, I wanna narrow this, our scope a little bit. You know, I was been reminded a couple times in, in the last couple of weeks that we are all just a grain of sand. I am a tiny little grain of sand on a very large beach. Most of us are not going to accomplish anything big or grandiose in our lifetimes. But each day we can do small things that make for a better existence for all of us. So realistically, you know, pick something, one or two things that are going to be your thing. And there are people, and I don't want to single anybody out, but there's some of you that I already know that when I think of you, I, I know what your thing is. And I bet you, you can too. Whatever you choose, here's a caveat. It needs to be apart from your family. It needs to be for God's family or for God's creation. Because if we're all just looking out for our own, then, then Jubilee never happens. And here's the thing, we're not sure Jubilee ever happened. It may have happened before the kingdom split. And I didn't know this until I went to seminary, but the, in, the old, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, there was one kingdom and then it became a divided kingdom of Israel and Judah. And it may have happened 
the Jubilee may have happened when it was just the, the single kingdom, but if it did, they never wrote about it. And you would think they would because it's a big deal. Right? But we can live inspired by God's vision. It inspired Jesus. And it's, it's in his first public sermon in the Gospel of Luke. After his mother's Magnificat, that isn't that different. Luke 1, 52, 53, he brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Again, freedom from suffering, striving for equality, a lack of oppression, earth care, jubilee. In the coming months, we will be working toward discerning where God is leading the Grace Presbyterian Church. What is God up to in Montclair that you were called to? What are the doors that God is opening for you? As we do that, I pray that each and every day, we each have an opportunity to plant our little seeds in the community that will bear fruit in its time, but give us great pleasure in the doing. And, and this has kept me in ministry for many years. May what I am doing be more important than how I feel about it on any given day. In Jesus' name, amen.